We are living in times like the world has never seen. We must be guided by the Word. This year, you are invited to a virtual camp meeting with the Kentucky Tennessee Conference. Sit down with the family and tune in live and get ready for three powerful speakers as they speak on different biblical topics, as they are guided by the Word. Dr. Gordon Beat, former president of the Southern Adventist University. The Word from the beginning. The Word builds community. The Word brings unity. Assistant to the President of the General Conference, Mike Ryan, will be speaking on Bible heroes guided by the Word. The Apostolic Church guided by the Word. The Reformers guided by the Word. Adventist pioneers guided by the Word. God's Last Day Church guided by the Word. President of the Chinese Union, Robert Falkenberg Jr. will be speaking on understanding the time. The universe next door. Our blessed hope. I want to welcome each and every one of you to our final day of our virtual camp meeting of 2020. I hope you've enjoyed this week. I know that there's been some precious messages given to us, and I pray that this challenges all of us to go deeper into the Word of God like never before. I pray that it doesn't just stop right here at camp meeting, but every day we dig into the Word of God. I'm so glad you could be with us this morning, and uh, I just want to let you know about our speaker that's going to be speaking this morning and again tonight at 7 o'clock. His name is Robert Falkenberg Jr. He's currently the president of the China Union. He has earned advanced degrees in religion and ministry from Southern University and Andrews University. He has served across the United States, has a pastor and ministerial director since 1990. He has authored two books, Health for the Harvest and Getting Back to Adventism. His message for today is Understanding the Times. I'm looking forward to hearing his message. Let's bow our heads for a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this camp meeting. It's been different than anything we've ever done before or seen, but I pray that your Holy Spirit might be poured out on Pastor Robert Folkenberg Jr. I thank you for his, his commitment and his wife's commitment, Audrey, to the work of God and their work there in China. I pray that all over the world, not just in China, but everywhere, that people will embrace your message for this time. Help us to love you like we've never loved you before and love your people that you died for everybody on this planet. For we ask it in Jesus' sweet and holy name. Amen. One of my favorite hymns has always been the hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. The song has always spoke to me of the assurance we have in Christ, regardless of what may be taking place around us. However, it wasn't until recently that I read more about the history of the hymn and what precipitated the writing of the hymn. The words are written by Horatio Spafford. Horatio Spafford knew something about life's unexpected challenges. He was a successful attorney and real estate investor who lost a fortune in the great fire, Chicago fire of 1871. Around the same time, his beloved four-year-old son died of scarlet fever. Thinking a vacation would do his family some good, he sent his wife and four daughters on a ship to England, planning to join them after he finished some pressing business at home. However, while crossing the Atlantic Ocean, the ship was involved in a terrible collision and sunk. More than 200 people lost their lives, including all four of Horatio Spafford's precious daughters. His wife, Anna, survived the tragedy Upon arriving in England, she sent a telegram to her husband that began, Saved alone, what shall I do? 
Horatio immediately set sail for England. At one point during his voyage, the captain of the ship, aware of the tragedy that had struck the Spafford family, summoned Horatio to tell him that they were now passing over the spot where the shipwreck had occurred. As Horatio thought about his daughters, words of comfort and hope filled his mind, and he wrote them down, and they have since become words we know to the well-beloved hymn, when peace like a river attends my way, when sorrow like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Are you or someone you know facing unexpected challenges in life right now? I think all of us have faced changes and adjustments as a result of the ongoing pandemic. Some of you may be facing very direct impacts as a result of the COVID-19, whether you are physically sick or a loved one of yours is is very sick or has even um, succumbed to to the illness that is around us. I'm reminded in, in, in difficult times and in challenges when we look to scripture and we look to characters of the past, the incredible strength that they drew from their faith, being able to press forward and being able to know where their assurance was, just as Horatio Spafford knew, to be able to write the incredible words that he did to this hymn. And so whatever you may be facing, I pray that we will be able to have that assurance and faith that Horatio Spafford did when he penned those words to it as well with my, so- with my soul. I want to leave you with some words from Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10, where the Bible reads, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. As we return our tithe and offerings this morning, returning our tithe and offerings is another act of total total faith and trust in God, total surrender to Him and his, and Him leading us going forward. As we return them this morning, we continue to emphasize uh, returning to our local church wherever we may attend. We can do that by um, giving to our local church budget or giving to a specific ministry that our local church has that is impacted that is helping and impacting those affected by COVID-19. As a reminder, you can give by going on to AdventistGiving.org, finding your local church and giving through there, or by going to your local church's website and giving online there. Or you can give a check to your local church treasurer by mailing it to your church or mailing it to your treasurer. I pray that the Lord will bless you um, this Sabbath And may you pray with me as we ask the Lord's blessing upon the offering this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you that every good and perfect gift comes from you. We thank you that you are with us in times that are good and in times that are difficult. We we all face uncertain times, not knowing what may come our way from one day to the next. But Lord, we keep our eyes on you. Help us to keep our eyes on you, to trust you fully in all things of our lives, including returning our tithes and offerings. We pray your blessing upon that which is given today, that your work may continue to go forward as we await your soon return. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining the 2020 Kentucky, Tennessee Virtual Camp Meeting. You are invited to open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18 reads as follows. Therefore, we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary, light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look at the things which are 
which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Good morning and uh, greetings from this side of the Pacific. I am speaking to you from uh, Hong Kong, China at the offices of our Chinese Union. And uh, I reckon that you are somewhere in either Kentucky or Tennessee joining this virtual camp meeting. And I am truly delighted and honored to be able to, to join you uh, from this side of the world. Though I'll be honest with you, I was looking forward to being a little closer, being there on the campus of Highland and being able to enjoy the beauty of uh, Tennessee and to see many of you friends face to face. But as you know very well, our world has changed dramatically since the first invitation was received to come and be your speaker a couple of years ago. Things are never, we never would have imagined that things would be as they are right now. But you know what? COVID-19 continues to wreak havoc around the world, lots of pain, lots of uncertainty. The ripple effects, as you know, are affecting pocketbooks and bank accounts and pension funds and uh, payrolls. And uh, we don't know where it will end. 
But today, I'd like to invite you. I'd like to invite you in the midst of the uncertainty, uh, in the midst of this sense that things are, are, are not normal and they might never be normal again, uh, in the midst of, of wondering what this portends, I'd like to invite you to be reminded afresh that with Christ by your side, you do not need to fear this crisis or any other that is to come, and that he is the king of the kingdom of God, and that he is coming very soon. Let's pray together before we start. Uh, but before I pray, I invite you to go and find your Bible. Don't know where you might keep it, but go get it. Let's study together, and let's invite the Holy Spirit now to bless us with his presence. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you so much that in Christ we are part of your great family. And you have family members scattered throughout this world, all of them facing uncertainty, all of us going through difficult times, but all of us having your hand in ours and ours in yours, knowing that you will be with us even unto the end of time. And this is wonderful. So today, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit will guide me as I speak, that you will touch the hearts and uh, open the hearts of those who are listening, that we will see clearly and be reminded afresh of the great universe next door. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, the worldview that we each have affects everything that we do. In fact, it affects how we think, how we organize our thoughts, how we define reality. That's what worldview is. In fact, at the base of every culture is a foundational worldview on which everything that you and I call culture, you and I call uh, reality is built. Let me just give you an example before you write this off as just a, a, another saying. Uh, by that I mean, oh yeah, that is true. I knew about worldview, but let me explain to you how deeply rooted worldview is in everything that we do. So for example, in my part of the world, when you come to a home uh, or even a church in some of the countries in the Northern Asia region, you must take off your shoes. You take off your shoes before you go into the house. You take off your shoes before you go into certain churches and uh, you put them away. I'm never worried about losing my shoes because my shoes are, are quite a bit bigger than everybody here being six, six foot six. But I've been to churches where there are hundreds of little cubicles and everybody puts their shoes in and goes in the church. Why? Why is it that people take their shoes off before they go into the house or into churches? In the, my part of the world, there are certain restaurants that you sit on the floor. In my part of the world, in certain countries, you sleep on the floor. What's up with this? It's because of our worldview. You see, to those who live in this part of the world, the floor in a home, the floor in a church, the floor in a restaurant is clean. So therefore, you take off your shoes. That's why you could sleep on the floor. That's why you can eat on the floor. In fact, if you think about it, in the American worldview and in the Western worldview, we have viewed the floor as dirty. That is why there is an entire industry called the furniture industry to get us up off the floor. We build chairs, we build sofas, we build uh, um, uh, beds. When you go into auditoriums, you have uh, pews or chairs. All of this, why do we do this? It's because we got to get up off the floor. Why do we get off the floor? Because the floor is dirty. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. When I was a kid, if you had dropped that precious piece of candy and it was on the floor for less than, is it three or five seconds? <clears throat> Maybe it depends on what part of the country you're from. The five second rule, you can eat it. But why is this five second rule there? Because we believe that if that piece of chocolate is on the floor longer than five seconds, it will get the cooties, it will get germs, you cannot eat it anymore. That's worldview. It affects even the furniture that you right now are sitting on. Your worldview also affects how you eat. I remember when I first came to Asia, sat down at a round table, and in front of me was a bowl, 
And, and everything is eaten over here in a small bowl that you can put in your hand about this big. And then they give me two sticks to eat with. And the two sticks, uh, they call quites, uh, uh, the two sticks, you're supposed to eat everything with these two sticks from this little bowl and you finish eating and then you refill the bowl and you refill the bowl. And it's completely different than where I came from in the United States where they give you a large plate and a small shovel and you fill it up and you eat usually as quick as you can and then you're done. In this part of the world, they give you a small bowl so you have to keep refilling it. They give you two sticks, so you take your time eating, especially those little grains of rice, and you spend the time socializing, building friendships and relationships. So much of the Asian culture, business, relationships, all takes place around the meal. Totally different. Americans created the fast food industry. Here, to eat is to Re build relationships. It affects even what you eat. You know, I remember, and I've seen this many times since, when we first moved to, to China, we went to a night market and we were going through and, and looking for some great uh, fried uh, tofu or some fried uh, noodles or rice. And we came across a big jar sitting on a table and it was full of, of living scorpions. And we saw a gentleman come up and he said to the, the people, the guy on the other side of the table, So each of those scorpions was four renminbi. And he said, oh, I'll take three of them. So they took, took them out one by one with some very long chopsticks, skewered them, put them into the deep frying oil. And we sat there in awe as they were pulled out. They were salted. And the man in front of us sat there and crunched away at him, thinking it was wonderful. I don't know of any place in the United States, any McDonald's or Taco Bell that at this point has deep fried scorpions to eat. Just a different mentality. You see, in this part of the world, sometimes these, these critters have medicinal qualities. But the reason I'm telling you this is that worldview defines what we eat, how we dress, how we sit, where we sit, everything. Your worldview will also affect how you perceive animals. Up until the fateful day that Balaam was offered that massive paycheck to go and curse those troublesome Israelites, Balaam always viewed a donkey as being a rather stupid animal, one that would help him get from point A to B, one that would help him carry heavy loads. But if you take your Bibles and turn with me to Numbers chapter 22, you will find an interesting story that totally changed Balaam's worldview. There in, in Numbers chapter 22, we see the story of, of Balaam being tempted to come and follow uh, these people who wanted to bring a curse upon the Israelites. And God said, no, you cannot go. Finally, he was overcome with greed and he got on that donkey, donkey and followed after uh, the men wanting desperately to get the payback. But when time and time again, as he was trying to catch up with the king's emissaries, the beast of burden, who had always been faithful, who had always followed his every command, veered this way and veered that way, and finally veered right into a wall and crushed his leg, Balaam was angry and he got off his donkey and he took his stick and he started pounding and hitting this animal before he could even catch himself. He was in a full-flung argument with his donkey. You remember the story. God's angel blocked the way. And finally, seeing this angel, Balaam's donkey sat down under him and would not move. And there, in that place, Balaam lost his temper and beat the donkey. And God gave the donkey speech, you remember? And the donkey said to Balaam, what have I ever done to you that you have beat me these three times? Balaam responded, because you have been playing games with me. If I had a sword, that's what the Bible says, I would take it and I would kill you with it. The donkey said to Balaam, am I not your trusty donkey on whom you've ridden for years right up until now? Have I ever done anything like this to you before? Have I? And Balaam 
there having a conversation with a donkey had to agree. No, you haven't. Then God, the Bible says there in Numbers 22, helped Balaam see, opened his eyes to what was truly going on. And he saw God's angel blocking the way and he was brandishing a sword. The Bible says that Balaam fell to the ground. His face was in the dirt as his eyes were open to the universe next door. Balaam had forgotten his calling. He had fallen for the flattery of men. He had succumbed to the cunning influence of the coin. He had thrown everything away about what he knew of the invisible kingdom and only focused on the visible kingdom. You know, and I love this story because it cuts right to the heart of our challenge in living life today. We are so easily consumed by the universe that envelops us that we forget, as James Sire states so well in his book on worldviews, that we forget the universe next door. And that is the universe, my dear brother and sister, that really counts. It's the universe that really matters. Jesus came to this world to announce, to proclaim, to broadcast far and near that the universe next door now was the universe that was ready to welcome sojourners from this earth, disciples of the Christ, the king of this new kingdom, into his everlasting kingdom. We are called as a church to let people know in this world that what we see is not where eternal peace and reconciliation takes place, but rather it's the universe next door. It is the kingdom of God that Jesus came to proclaim that gives us hope, that gives us connection to eternity. And so the call of your Savior is to live a totally sold out life for the sake of the King and His kingdom, is it not? To dedicate your God-given gifts, to dedicate your energies and your experience and to dedicate everything to the all-consuming cause of building and expanding, expanding the kingdom of light, this kingdom of good, this kingdom of love and hope and life. That is what we're called for as a church, especially at the end of time today, surrounded by uncertainty. We are called to proclaim and to expand the kingdom of God. So the call of our Savior is to live a totally sold out life. What I'm saying is that God is calling you to be an engineer for Christ. He's calling you to be a nurse for Christ. He's calling you to be a foreman for Christ, a construction worker for Christ, a teacher for Christ. I Put whatever you wish. But no matter what it is that you are doing as a vocation, God has also given you the wonderful, exciting call and adventure to point people to the kingdom of God and the coming of the king who is coming very, very, very soon. This is our calling as a church. You know, it's also to allow the pervasive, all-consuming reality of the king and his kingdom to dictate everything that we do. All that you say to guide all the decisions that you make should be guided and influenced by the universe next door. Then and only then, I believe, will this church truly grow and explode because we will find that when we have the biblical worldview, the fire in our soul will burn bright, passionately. The love for the King will constrain us so that we cannot help but live and share the love of the King. Let me come back again to this issue of the worldview. We must ask our Master Jesus every day to open our eyes so that we can see, so that we can perceive, so that we can hear the still small 
voice so that we can perceive with spiritual eyes and ears the cacophonous sounds of the great controversy that are around us, that surround us in our daily living. But we sometimes just, just, just are blind to them. We think that this is just normal, but actually we are in the midst of a great controversy between good and evil, between light and darkness. It's raging around us between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. And if we would open our eyes, we can see this happening all around us. And you can see it clearly now with this thing called COVID-19 that is indiscriminately taking young and old, innocent people. That's the random ugliness of sin. We are living in a time of pestilence because the father of pestilence is at work. If it were not, I believe for the grace of God, it would be much worse. But we are still living in this time of of, of battle. In this time of battle, we need to open our eyes and see that our king is by our side. And though there will be difficulties, and though we go through dark times, the ultimate victory of the king is certain. It's certain. Why do we know this? Because our eyes are open to the spiritual reality. Here's the question for today then. Here is the issue I might say at hand. Will you seize the adventure that God has called you to to live for the king there in Kentucky, there in Tennessee? Or will your gaze be riveted only on the things of this world which are merely seen today and then disappear tomorrow, forgotten? Oh, I love the way that Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 points us to this universe next door. Take your Bibles that you went and got. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. And I'm reading from the New King James Version. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Are you feeling discouraged? Are you feeling overwhelmed? Paul is saying to you, we do not lose heart. But why? Do we not lose heart? What are the grounds for this hope? Paul answers that. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day as we are walking with Christ, as we are daily filled with this Holy Spirit, as we're spending time in his word, we are becoming changed into the likeness of Christ. His grace is saturating every cell of our body, changing our our character into his likeness. He says, we are being renewed, it says, day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. That's verse 16. Now look at verse 17. For our light affliction, I'm sorry, verse 18. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Yes, we're going through light afflictions or maybe heavy afflictions. And we know that this is just for a time, but the things which are not seen, oh, those are eternal. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of God that surrounds us in Christ Jesus through his Holy Spirit, that is what is eternal. The greatest need I believe in my life daily and in the life of our church is for us to live lives fully consumed with this kind of worldview, that of Christ and of his kingdom. That when we wake up in the morning, we realize that we're not just going to work or going down to Home Depot to buy some things to fix up up something in the garage. No, no, no. Yeah, these are important. We need to do those things. But as we do them, we are living with the worldview that says we are ambassadors of Christ. Here, now, sent out by God to be his ambassadors for the kingdom of light, the kingdom of God. And the king is coming. we got to let people know. We need to preach this three angels message. We need to share the hope that we have. And I believe that if we have this kind of worldview, it will affect everything, everything that we do, every decision that we make. From the home budget that we make to the calendar that we make for our time to our priorities, 
of what it is that we live for to what we watch on TV, anything, everything will be affected because we now live in the context of the kingdom of God. I mean, it reminds me of, of uh, what we're dealing with today. You see, in, in our part of the world, you don't go outside without putting on a mask. We carry them everywhere. Even in our office, we have to wear them if we are not outside of our, if we're outside of our, uh, our office uh, cubicle itself. When we go to the grocery store, when we get on the bus, no matter what we do, we have to wear this mask. And I'll be honest with you, I do not like wearing the mask. First of all, it always uh, fogs up my glasses. Secondly, I feel like I'm breathing through a sock. It's hard to get my breath. But I know that it's useful. I understand what it is. But this COVID-19 pandemic has affected everything about our life. We, I wash my hands so many more times than I used to. I, I, we have the, the little hand sanitizers everywhere. No matter where you go here in Hong Kong, almost every store, grocery store, they have the hand sanitizers. They want everybody using them. And you have to put on the masks. And sometimes people even have shields over their face. And uh, you have to sit in, in restaurants and other things uh, two meters apart and keep that social distancing. And like you, and uh, now is from what I understand, and, and here in our part of the world, all across China, and here in Hong Kong, Macau, the churches are closed and everything is done virtually through these kind of platforms. It affects everything because, because why? Can I see those, those coronaviruses? Can I see them with my naked eye? But yet I, it's affected my entire life. It's affected how I shop, or where I go, how I eat, what I wear. Why? Because I know, I believe, I see the evidence that there are these little critters out there called coronaviruses, COVID-19, and that in order for me to be protected against them, I got to wear this mask. I've got to do these things. Do you see how the unseen has affected the seen? It's the same way with the kingdom of God. Brothers and sisters, we need to let the kingdom of God fully, fully consume us. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who gave his life for the cause of Christ, reminds us that there is no such thing as a half Christian. He reminds us that salvation is free, but discipleship will cost you your life. Salvation is free, praise God. But if you're going to follow Jesus, he requires everything of you. Everything, if you're going to be his disciple. If you're going to go into the kingdom of God, you can enter freely by his grace and you can have that assurance of salvation. But if you're going to follow Jesus, you must daily sing the song, All to Jesus I Surrender. It will cost you your life and everything that you do, that you think. It reminds me of Pastor Way. It's not his real name. He'd been repeatedly arrested and beaten for his faith in my part of the world here in China. His congregation met at a home and constantly was forced to move from place to place, from location to location. Oh, and the police had threatened him time and time again after arresting him to stop his kingdom work. Stop growing the kingdom. They promised that they would leave him alone if he would just simply conform, if he would just stop talking about Jesus. What amazed me about his story was that is that once while he was leading in a house church service, the authorities barged in, they arrested him, and they were as they were hauling him off to jail, he stopped the police and said, excuse me, can I please take my bag with me? And they became curious and they said, what is this bag about? They went and grabbed the bag and they looked inside, ruffled through it, and there was nothing but a change of clothes. You see, Pastor Wei had assumed, had prepared himself that most likely when he left home, he would not go back home. When he went to, the, to this church service to lead in the things of the kingdom, he would most likely be arrested and he would go to jail and be beaten. So he said, I might as well bring a, a change of clothes. But what really struck me about this is, why would you go to church and lead out when you know that you will be beaten, that you know that you would suffer? Why not just conform? And the answer was simply this, because the king was so precious to Pastor Wei. 
because the cause of Christ was so compelling and all pervasive in his life that he would never, ever give up living in this kingdom of God and working to expand this kingdom. The reality of Jesus was greater than the reality of suffering physically and emotionally for the cause of Christ. You see, dear brothers and sisters, the call of your master is not just to serve him one day in seven, to not just render him one dollar out of ten, but he is calling you to give him all of your time, to give him all of your resources, to offer him all of your talents, all of you fully baptized, all of you fully immersed in this invisible kingdom called the kingdom of God. If we have the wrong worldview, we are going in the wrong direction. But if we have the right spiritual worldview, we will have a journey in life that will be wrought with some challenges, maybe persecutions, maybe pain, but we will have a life. We will enjoy a journey with a purpose and with a companion who said he will never leave us nor forsake us. Jesus Christ, our Lord. How are you today with Jesus? I just pray that you will have and that you will be immersed in this worldview of the kingdom of God. That everything that you do, that everything that you think, that everything that you offer will be offered for the cause of Christ. Jesus gave everything for you. Shall we not in turn live joyfully in his kingdom? As we are living now at the time of the end, as we know that we are entering into probably an unprecedented time of turmoil, I don't know what the future holds, and it really doesn't matter because as the saying goes, I know who holds the future because Jesus will be walking with me if I live in the worldview of the kingdom of God. If I live in the worldview, oh, I've got to do this and this, and I've got to look this way and that way in this, the visible world, then I will be stranded. I will feel hopeless. I will feel lost. But when you walk with Jesus and you expand his kingdom, when you walk with the king of the kingdom of righteousness, you are never lost. You know where you're going and you have a clear destination. And that is to see Jesus face to face very soon. Please commit today to surrender all to him. Commit today to live in the reality and joy of the universe next door. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for Jesus. He is the center of our faith. He is our hope. He is our present help. He is our companion. He is the king of the kingdom he came to proclaim. And Lord, forgive us when we have forgotten or the kingdom of God has been clouded by the things around us. At this time, in this place, at this moment, Lord, all of us here, we want to say, Jesus, open our eyes. Unplug our ears. Let us see the spiritual realities of the great controversy. And may we daily, Lord, help us daily to be filled with your Holy Spirit so that we will live a life fully dedicated to you as our Lord and Savior and to the mission of Christ to expand the good news of Jesus to every kindred, tongue, and nation. Thank you for walking with us. Thank you for giving us hope. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. May God bless you and uh, walk with you every single day, and he will. I know you were blessed by that message, so be sure not to miss Elder Falkenberg's final message this evening. It's an appropriate close to our online camp meeting. It's titled, our blessed hope. I'll look forward to having you back here in just a few hours at 6 p.m. Central, 7 p.m. Eastern. And now, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>